It's Milo. G'day. Welcome back to Australia. The countdown is on for when the fabulous one arrives in this beautiful nation. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to tell you, by the way, thank you for uh, listing my tour dates. I'm excited to tell you Sydney is now completely sold out. But you don't need to worry. We're adding a new date on the 30th of November. Australia seems to be very excited about my arrival, as you so kindly said. Um, so we're going to add another date. We're, uh, it's, just, it's growing all the time. It seems to become, be becoming a phenomenon. Now, what I love about, uh, about even talking to you on television and the absurdity of the left and some of its, its nuttier members is that by even simply talking to you, we automatically agree with everything yeah. you've ever said. Uh, uh, by simply talking to you, <laughs> we're, uh, we're, we're, we're empowering everything you've ever done. By simply acknowledging your existence, we are, uh, we are apparently feeding some sort of uncontrollable beast. Don't you love it when there used to be a time when on television and radio you were able to talk to provocative people People, because they were provocative, it wasn't seen as an automatic endorsement of everything they've ever done. Well, two points on that. The first is that this idea that you have to, you can only put people on TV or only interview people with whom you agree is a sort of leftist invention designed to keep conservatives off television. Um, and the second thing is, my views are, I mean, I, I guess I can be provocative, I can be controversial, I can sort of stoke the whatever it is. Um, but at my actual opinions, the things I say are, are fairly ordinary, conservative, uh, libertarian points of view shared by millions of Australians, tens of millions of Americans, millions of Brits. What I actually believe is fairly mainstream, but because I say it in a persuasive and in an attractive way, the left considers me especially dangerous. So when they say, oh, he's an extremist or he's far right, what they really mean is he's right wing and effective. Um, and they, they've come up with this new rule, this, this BS rule, which is you can only interview people with whom you completely agree otherwise you are endorsing them and giving them a platform, providing a platform for hate. Oh, give me a break. Um, you know, it's just an invention of the left. It's nonsense. This idea that you can't engage with, and as a journalist it's particularly offensive, the idea that you can't even engage with or have phone calls with or meet people with whom you might disagree, and especially, in fact, people with, with whom you might disagree strongly because they're the only interesting people out there. Who wants to spend their entire life sitting around in a knitting circle saying, mm, yes, I agree with you, Susan? <laughs> yeah. But also a knitting circle that, that seems to police itself so aggressively that, as you know, uh, it, it's this scenario <laughs> where, um, you know, if it, th 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 they find... It doesn't matter the context in which you said something. It doesn't matter the context in where you said it or, uh, or what exactly you were talking about and how long you were in that single conversation you had been. They, they try to say, well, hang on, because of this one thing that was over the line, therefore you can't have a conversation yep. where... And, 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 you know, Gavin McGuinness... Uh, uh, a fellow provocateur who, uh, who a lot of us uh, are very fascinated by in Australia as well. Um, he sort of used to talk about He's this great. idea I that I thought on... Yeah, I, th I, th I thought a great, great opening act. Uh, I, I thought that, uh, you know, I thought you were able to work things out. And I think this is the thing that's very interesting about people like yourself, is that people should understand that uh, it's, it, it's not the final say, it's part of a conversation. Well, it's not just that. We shouldn't just engage with people uh, with whom we disagree because we want to have a healthy and lively debate. But people, you know, it's... It's part of the left's mission, I think, to hammer iconoclasts out of public life because they're so desperate to put everybody in boxes with identity politics. You know, black people have to believe this, gays have to believe this, women have to believe this. If you step outside those narrow bounds which have been set for us by the progressive left, you become very dangerous. And iconoclasts who might believe in a little bit of this and a little bit of this and a little bit of this, in other words, independent thinkers, become problematic for them because they don't really know where to put them, they don't know how to fight them, they don't know how to get them out of public life. And there's nothing much more iconoclastic than a gay Jewish Brit with a black husband who, you know, hates the progressive left. I'm not supposed to exist. I, by the ordinary rules of leftist, you know, universe building, I shouldn't be possible. But I am. And people really, really love me. And they don't know how to handle that. So they're, they're you know, they come up with all of these weird, bizarre, peculiar rules. But the reality is nobody fits into the boxes the left has created for us. Nobody conforms to this, this stereotype of what black people should believe and how they should behave and, and, and how they should vote. And women and all the rest of it. And, and in fact, if you ask 
ask people, we look at the study data, actually go out into, you know, real America or you know, real Australia and ask people what they think about things, you'll discover that their opinions are quite far removed from the opinions of people on TV and people in Parliament. I mean, think about America, for instance. Fewer than one in five women describe themselves as a feminist in America, and it's just 7% in the UK. These are, you know, and, and yet you'd be, you know, you'd be, even the reverse statistic, like 93% would be underplaying it if you ask people who work in media in those countries how many of them is feminist. The, you know, the, the, the opinions expressed by those who supposedly rule over us and supposedly have our best interests at heart, who run the media, who run the academy, who run all of the think tanks and everything, all the organs of power in civil society versus the rest of us, it's an extraordinary gulf. And, you know, people are messy and complicated and have, you know, contradictory beliefs sometimes and wrestle with their uh, opinions and views and, and belief systems their whole lives. And the left wants to sort of shuffle us off into boxes for electoral reasons and for reasons of social engineering. Real people don't work that way. And I think my existence and the existence of other people, I mean, Lauren Southern in, in the US and, and uh, certainly there are some activists who are starting to break out of the, these uh, liberal boxes that, um, that have been made for us. Um, we're a real threat to this idea that the, the world could be organized according to skin color, sexuality, and gender, because we don't believe that. We believe that the, the world should be organized by ideas. We think people should be organized by their aspirations, by their hard work, what they believe, um, and how they've come to that conclusion, rather than what they were born as. That used to be the position of the left, but it isn't anymore. Well, it's this thing where, you know, I'm somebody who grew up uh, in, in sort of 80s rock and roll, and I've got to say that I think that the best way to describe people like yourself, forget all this alt-right business, is that I think that there is... I, I think your brand of conservatism, your brand of conversation is punk. I think that the sacred cows are no longer, you know, the Catholic Church and, uh, and, and, and headmasters at private schools. The sacred cows now are <laughs> the left. They are the institutions. Yep. They are... Uh, conversations where uh, people want to pretend that to criticise radical Islam means you're criticising Islam. Uh, yet, if they want to have a conversation about pedophile priests, they don't turn around and say, now, of course, remember, there's only a very small proportion of, of priests that are, you know, instead, uh, we're under we understand that distinction. So, do you think that you're, you're as much punk as provocateur? People have described me as punk, and I take it as the compliment that I know it's intended to be, but I think it's a bit more than that. I think it's more like heavy metal or death metal. I think the best uh, analogy for what's happening on the right in conservatism in a lot of the West, and I include Australia in the West, um, it's closer to what Marilyn Manson was experiencing in the 90s. He was wrongly blamed for Columbine, wrongly blamed for all sorts of different things by the religious right, who were the bad guys in those days, uh, at least as far as cultural you know, policing was concerned. Ma Manson was wrongly blamed, and he was a huge act with millions of fans but couldn't play anywhere. He kept getting his shows cancelled for on sp you know, spurious grounds. People were making up all kinds of nonsense about him, uh, lying about him routinely, and there was violence at his shows as a result of the tension stoked by the media. I mean, there's, what better analogy is there for today's populist, nationalist, anti-political correctness, anti-feminist, uh, anti-Black Lives Matter, um, conservative grassroots. I mean, it, you know, people aren't getting shot outside Amy Schumer's shows or outside, uh, you know, Lena Dunham, whatever Lena Dunham does these days, um, but they are outside mine, and that's because the media has created a climate of fear and anticipation and horror around me, and, and for just the same sort of bad reason and just the same sort of nefarious politicking as happened to Marilyn Manson in the 90s. I see myself very much in the vein of Brett Easton Ellis, um, you know, trying desperately to get American Psycho published and then staying on the shelves, and Marilyn Manson, um, both of whom are, are heroes of mine, because these are people who are going out challenging the, the, the established status quo and, and suffering enormously as a result. They became countercultural icons, but they, they, you know, they, 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 they were wrestling with the mainstream. They were wrestling with, 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 uh, you know, with, with culture and with all of the organs of civil society, all of the establishment uh, uh, personalities and, and institutions throughout their entire careers. Why? No good reason, really, except that they went against the prevailing orthodoxy. Now, in the 90s, that was probably the religious right with their horror about violence and sex. Well, today, it's the left with their horror about the wrong language, the wrong word use, cracking jokes about the wrong people. You make a joke about, you know, a, a black lesbian and you're ejected from polite society. That's ludicrous, utterly ludicrous. And there's not really much difference between what's happening to me today and what happened to Marilyn Manson and Brett Easton Ellis, who are now rightly seen as pioneers and, and trailblazers and great artists. Um, in the 90s and the early 2000s. So I like, uh, you know, I like it when people say it's punk because, it, you know, it sounds cool. But I think heavy metal and some of the more 
some of the edgier and more dangerous literature that was coming out in the 90s and the early 2000s is a, is a better analogy. But whatever you want to call it, you know, something like that is definitely going on. Well, it was intended as a compliment, so, so, so that's clear. Uh, no, I know, and I'm I, grateful. Uh... Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> what, uh, what I'm interested by is, I mean, it's pretty obvious everyone when they talk to you here in Australia, because you're in the United States, they all want to talk Trump, they all want to talk America, but clearly the analogous society to Australia is your home country. It's the UK. Uh, to some degrees, it's probably Canada as well. And uh, how much of that are you going to bring to uh, Australia and these shows to say the, the, the warnings of, of hyper-political correctness about criminal penalties for offence that exist in these places? Because, yeah. you know, once you've got freedom of speech written in your constitution, it changes the whole thing. But that doesn't exist in Australia. It doesn't exist in Canada. And it didn't exist for you in your home country. Well, one of the reasons I left the UK was precisely because language was becoming so uh, rigorously policed and the consequences for stepping outside the politically correct um, consensus were so uh, total that I found myself kind of propelled to the United States. I think I can come to Australia. By the way, my book is coming out in Australia, so I'm happy to say that we're actually able to publish it locally. It's going to come out on November 2nd, um, so you can read it before before you see me in the shows uh, and get a, get a sense of what's happening in America and how bad the situation is. But in, in, in Europe specifically, the, the infringements on, on, on speech are horrific. I think I can explain to you the good and the bad of both systems. I like to think of Australia as a sort of... Uh, peculiar concoction of the best of, of European and American um, habits and customs and laws. And it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an int a really interesting kind of muddying of the two cultures. So maybe you're not going to go as far down the road of censorship as Canada and the UK, but you still have some... I mean, the, the idea that you could be criminalised for cracking a joke, the idea that you could, you know, get a visit from the police because you used the wrong word on Facebook is so astonishingly ridiculous. When you actually step back and you get a fence taking out of your head. You stop thinking about, you know, um, uh, whether you, someone's feelings might be hurt and focus instead on, are we telling the truth? Are we exploring culture? Are we looking at studies that might help us to, you know, institute policies that help, that help people? Are we just looking at real stuff, fact, reason and logic, versus worrying about whether somebody's offended? Um, you know, I think these are questions that Western countries have to ask themselves because we want to, you know, this, this is right now, the next 30 years is where we decide as a culture, you know, Western-wide, if we're going to stand up for liberty, freedom, freedom of speech, capitalism, property rights, all of the things that have made the West the best place to live in the world, or if we're going to capitulate to the rise of the East, if we're going to, you know, if we're going to effectively start a sort of downward spiral, I don't think it's too late. And that's why I'm very grateful to, to Penthouse magazine, which is not the kind of um, uh, publication you would imagine would sponsor the, the tour of a, you know, sort of a lecture tour with, of, of an author from America, but they, they seem to get free speech, which makes me think, well, uh, and also, of course, the, the tour selling out everywhere it makes me think there is some hope for Australia because maybe your your morning show hosts and your uh, you know and your journalists are not quite getting it, but Australians are clearly getting it. But of course, uh, and you know the, the the huge gulf between so much of the public discussion in the media and and, uh, and and the reality of how normal people interact is that they could see that when you get invited onto those TV shows, you're invited onto them so the hosts can wag their finger at you. But little do they know, all this does is as soon as you turn around <laughs> and say, "Hey, kids, don't eat the chocolate. Do not eat the chocolate. This chocolate is very bad for you." What do they want the to do? Going to go and do? You come back. You come back to them and they're smeared. You say, "Don't eat the." cookies and you come back and there are crumbs and chocolate and bits of raisin all over your face. I know I'm like that and I don't think that I am some outlier who is just terminally mischievous whose, you know, instinct to be defiant and to break rules is unique to me. I think everybody has that within them. And here's the thing. Madonna in the 1990s was having her music videos banned from MTV. What was the one music video you wanted to see? Madonna's. Um, you know, my book now, you know, against the, the, the entire combined mass weight of the publishing industry, uh, you know, the, the press and all the rest of it, I managed to have my book on the New York Times bestseller list for five weeks without a single review and a single interview in the mainstream media. Almost unprecedented. It's an extraordinary achievement. What does it tell you? Actual people care about stuff that our supposed tastemakers either don't even know about or are completely wrong about or hate for some stupid political reason. There's some hope here. And, there, and I think it's, the, you know, this rise of the sort of populist, nationalist, anti-political correctness movement in the West, um, you know, it's coming up from the grassroots. It is successfully uh, installing presidents and prime ministers and, and getting, you know, Brexit to happen and stuff like that. And it's creating new media stars and media personalities who aren't, aren't, aren't afraid to, to stick two fingers up at, at, um, at what's going on. But I, I noticed, you know, I was on a morning show um, in Australia and, and I, I 
I figured that's what was what was happening. Um, they got me on to sort of say, now come on, you obviously don't believe anything you say, and aren't you just rude and offensive for the sake of it? Aren't you a child? And they had to cut the interview short because they realised that I, actually I wasn't some idiot. I wasn't you know some redneck Trump supporter or uh, you know or a troll out for attention. Actually, I had serious things to say, and they weren't prepared for that. So they cut the interview short. I think about five minutes or something. It was very humiliating for them. Um, and and that they'll never have me on again because they were so horribly outclassed. But the, the point that I'm trying to make is that people generally aren't prepared for views that, um, you know, that, that, that step so far outside of their safe boxes and they assume that you must be a carnival barker or a satirist or a comedian or in some other way unserious. Well, people who read my book know otherwise. Australians know otherwise. They know that there, you know, that there is a, another way to organise society. There's another way to communicate with one another that does not rely on language policing, on having our crayons rearranged by school marmish feminists in the media. That awful woman you have, Clementine Ford, you know, <laughs> wagging her finger at you know men saying the wrong thing, or you know, is it man spreading, mansplaining? My goodness, it's sick making and exhausting and pointless and conspiratorial. It is based on garbage, and people are sick of it. The last 30 years of culture in the West was about the ascendant progressive left with its, you know, stranglehold on popular culture. The next 30 years is going to look very, very different, and it is going to be a deeply miserable time for the, for the forces of authoritarianism who want to tell us how we can speak, what we can read, how, you know, how we can express ourselves. They're going to have a really miserable time the next 30 years, and I'm going to be there making sure of it. <laughs> All right, I've got one more before we let you go and continue to be fabulous on somebody else's show, is that uh, I wanted to, uh, to ask, how have, you, how have you studied up uh, about Australia and what do you change about the show that you're going to bring here? Or, you know, is, is, is it down pat pretty much now where there's some general things you want to do and insert local idiot here, pretty much normal stuff that you do everywhere, insert local <laughs> idiot here? <laughs> it's at local idiots into show, otherwise proceed as planned. Well, I tend to think people come to see me, and rather than me kind of, you know, patronising and flattering and pandering and mollycoddling by kind of brushing up on the plane about something that happened in Australian news, I can talk in more general terms about what's happening in Western culture, Western civilization. You know, I want to start a revival of free speech, free expression. I want, you know, to, to stop the routine demonization and ridicule of Christians in public life. I want to do all kinds of things that I think are universal to, the, to Western Europe, to Australia and to America. So I, I will definitely be giving some special Australia-specific uh, routines, uh, you you know, the, the shows will be unique to Australia for sure. I may give a talk that I don't give anywhere else. Um, we're putting it all together now. I can tell you, though, the more I read about, the Aust about Australia, the more I talk to, to, to my new friends over there, as Andrew Bolt and, and Mark Latham and all these, all these people that I'm getting to know, the more I realise Australia is just like in America and just like the UK. It is, it is on the, the precipice of this, um, of this decision. I mean, it, it, it's right on the border now. We have to make a big choice. People have to make a choice. Do they want to go for authoritarian and controlled by somebody else, whether it's the right or the left, telling us what we can do and how we can speak, or do they want to vote for freedom and fun? And it's fairly clear which side of the divide I sit on, so my shows are about exactly that, freedom and fun. Uh, you know, I'm sure, I, I try to demonstrate to people that it's okay to laugh and nothing bad happens when you crack a joke about somebody you're not supposed to. In fact, nothing bad happens too when somebody comes and, and, and whines at you and, and makes you feel like you're going to lose your job and lose your life for a, uh, for a bad word you used and you just stick a middle finger up at them. Um, really nothing bad happens when you tell the scolds, the nannies, um, you know, the, the, the vandals of the progressive left to go screw themselves. So I'm gonna, I try to empower and encourage people to do that and uh, yeah no I definitely I definitely have some unique uh, uh, unique treats for Australia but you'll have to come to the tour to find out what they are <laughs>